Thank you, Jenny, I think. <laughs> um, as Jenny said, I'll be talking about the joyous. I'm a little nonplussed that this many people came tonight, tell you the truth. Um, and I'm going to uh, have examples of evolutionary strategies which uh, are applicable to other species of plants. In fact, most species of plants uh, in general. Um, it's funny, I have a license plate that says Choyas, and I, a couple of times I pulled into gas stations to get gas, and people have walked up to me and said, I hate Choyas. <laughs> uh, for those of you that need glasses, this is a quote from J.M. Bigelow, who was on the uh, famous Whipple expedition that came through here at about 1852. Uh, and he observed that this is about the uh, teddy bear choya, which is named after him, a cylinder punch of Bigelovii, armed with spines worse than those of a porcupine. It is called by the Mexicans chug. The plant is the horror of man and beast. Our mules are as fearful of it as ourselves. I love choyas. Um, so what defines choyas? Choyas have cylindrical stems that uh, store water. They're succulent. And uh, they have aerials with glochids. Glochids are these little tiny spines that are deciduous. Something's going wrong. Uh, and get into your clothes and your skin and irritate you a lot. And then the spines have sheaths uh, and retrorsed barbs. So, there is an aerial, and it's at the end of this uh, protuberance, which is called a tubercle. And there's a little broken there. And uh, here, here's a photomicrograph of uh, a spine with these rutorous barbs. So that when they go in your skin, they, it takes a lot to get them out. It's very painful. Um, and then they have these sheaths, which is very diagnostic, which came off this uh, spine here. And th th these sheaths separate uh, choyas from all other cacti, including the, the, the choyas of South America. All right. There are approximately 35 species of choyas. And I say approximately because we're always arguing what's a subspecies, what's a, what's a species. And uh, we have at least one that would undescribed species from California. Yeah, and even recently, my wife Danny and I went to Baja California and we found two more populations that are uniform as far as morphology, but don't look like anything else. So whether or not they're just, they fit into the variation of other species or whether it actually are new taxa, taxa being subspecies or species or uh, other categories, we don't know. Uh, choyas are uh, distributed through most of Western uh, North America, uh, up into Colorado, and uh, as far south as the tip of Baja California, and down into Mex mainland Mexico as far as Oaxaca, and then in the Caribbean, on Cuba, and Dominican Republic, and uh, those are semi-native. But the ones in South America and Africa, and there's some in Spain and Australia, those have been introduced, so most certainly. And these that are, occur in the uh, Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean are obviously mismapped. And so <laughs> it underscores the uh, necessity to recheck data when you get it off the internet. Okay, this is the one from Cuba, near Guantanamo Bay, uh, Cylindropuncha hystrix. Uh, I think it's quite a lovely species. Um, so what about the evolutionary processes? We have apogony, which is asexual reproduction. Hybridization, which I think everybody here knows what that is. Uh, polyploidy is the 
increase in the number of chromosomes of any organism. Uh, you can have aneuploidy, which is an increase in one or two chromosomes. It happens in humans, and it's fairly detrimental. Uh, or you can have complete duplication of genomes. For instance, cactus, the base number is 11. So in a, in, in a diploid uh, choya, the somatic cells have 22 chromosomes. You get 11 from one parent and 11 from another parent. Uh, but you can have a base, the base number is 11, but you can have 22, 33, 44, 55, 66, 77, and 88 in choyas. And it's helpful with the evolution and taxonomy of the species to know that. And finally, dioecy is nothing new to people because people are dioecious. Basically, each individual has its own sex, either male or female. Okay. So apogamy. Apogamy is reproduction uh, without sex, basically. And you can have apogamous seeds, and especially in the genus Apuntia, which is the, are the prickly pears. Um, and, uh, but that doesn't happen in choyas. Choyas usually disseminate uh, apomictically from stem segments. Uh, the success of these apomictic species, uh, hypothetically, is that they have these particularly pre-adaptive genomes that can spread like wildflower through uh, vegetative reproduction. This is one example. Uh, again, this is the teddy bear choya, cylinder punch of big alovii, and it's dropping joints uh, onto the ground and producing new individuals. Another example is cylinder puncha molesta, which is aptly named. <laughs> and you often see pictures in, uh, with people having them stuck in their forehead and whatnot. So. But I think it forms these beautiful clones. And uh, here again are the joints falling down and producing new shoots. And another example is uh, cylinder puncha choya. Obviously, it, it was named after the indigenous term for uh, the genus. And it also can drop these joints. And here's, here's one with, uh, that actually has fruits that were on the joint when it dropped. But then you can see it forming new shoots from there. So, OK, so hybridization, uh, basically the exchange of genes between and among species. And I say among species because we have found what looked like hybrids, putative hybrids that can only be explained by the involvement of, of at least three different uh, species. This is one of my favorite ones. Uh, yeah, this is the chain fruit, oh, wrong one. This is the chain fruit choya. Uh, it's an underpunch of fulgida, and it has these strange fruits that proliferate and form chains. This is the Christmas choya. Um, which has very thin stems, yeah, but it has these fruits that are uh, spineless and smooth and red. Uh, my neighbor comes over and, and, and picks these off my plants and cooks them up. I've never, never tasted them myself. And then the hybrid has intermediate uh, stem morphology and it has these very strange chaining fruits that, some, that are somewhat similar to the Christmas choya. Um, again, uh, hybridization is the combination of genetic material between or among species. Uh, in Troyes, the F1 hybrids, the, the first generation hybrids, are generally morphologically evenly intermediate. So uh, it's usually easy to tell a hybrid because it looks like it's halfway between both parents morphologically. Um, this is a diagram of the hybrids that I know of in Choyas. Um, you can see that there are actually quite a few. <laughs> yeah. um, hybrids are generally considered as proven to be hybrids only after 
well-designed genetic or cytogenetic studies are conducted. Um, and I want to emphasize well-designed because, well, genetics has developed and evolved in itself over the last 20, 30 years. In fact, I think back in the 80s, we looked at 256 base pairs from the DNA, and now we're looking at something like 256,000 base pairs. So, and, it's, and it keeps evolving more and more. Um, however, and most choice hybrids that we consider as hybrids are uh, evidenced by, again, the intermediate morphology or additive traits and the demography. So if you're walking in the Sonoran Desert and you see us, uh, hundreds of staghorn choyas, and you're seeing maybe hundreds of the Christmas choyas, and then you come across this one plant, and you think, oh, that's different. And it looks like it's halfway between the staghorn, and, but it's only one plant. So you figure it's not a, probably not a species, because there's, there's only one of them. So demography helps, too. Um, Here's an example of a fairly local and fairly common hybrid. A Canthicarpa, I think, is uh, the staghorn choya. And the kind of carpa is either the silver choya or the golden choya, depending on the color of its she spine sheaths. So uh, this occurs where the two species are sympatric. And it, it's pretty. Generally, if you see both species, eventually you'll see one of these. Okay, let's go on to polyploidy. Again, uh, in choyas, or actually in cactus in general, we have never seen an aneuploid. We have never seen just a few extra chromosomes. It's either the whole genome du duplicating or nothing. As that's called neuploidy. In this case, uh, I think this has 55 chromosomes. So it's a pentaploid. Um, uh, generally, it's thought that polyploids are so successful, and they often are successful, because they have duplicated genetic material, therefore more variation and more apt to uh, a, a better ability to invade new habitats. Here's an example of uh, two chromosome races within one species. This is cylinder punch of Ramlosissima, which is the diamond choya. And you can see over in the uh, southeast segment of the pop uh, distribution, there are tetraploid individuals. And everywhere, everywhere else, we've only found diploid. That doesn't mean we'll find tetraploids in the future, but it is interesting that the Tetraploids are so far confined to that area. There are no differences between, in morphologically, between the diploids. At least there are enough differences between the diploids and the tetraploids to call them different subspecies or different other, other different species. On the other hand, our local choya, the Whipple choya, named after Lieutenant Whipple of the famous Whipple expedition. Uh, for a new route for the railroad in 1853, 1852. Um, is diploid in the eastern part of this range and it's tetraploid in the uh, western portion. And here we see the blue is the distribution of the diploids. Uh, and then this yellow is the distribution of the uh, tetraploids, and we're calling this Whippleii, well, subspecies you notice now. Here's the, our, our local choya, uh, the diploid form. It's going to be a cylinder punch of Whippleii, subspecies Whippleii. And uh, here it is again with the fruits, yellow knobby fruits, and then you notice they're kind of smooth and often different colored. And if you do a cross section, you notice it has these very thick fruit walls, much thicker than uh, 
those of the uh, typical subspecies. Um, there are some successful triploid species. In fact, the teddy bear choy is mostly triploid. It's widespread. It's very unique morphologically, uh, often very abundant. So it, I would call it successful. And um, one of the hypotheses we came up with was that um, this is going. This is uh, uh, meiosis one, and that's the uh, sort of the uh, metaphase plate there. And in diploids, you would have uh, bivalence. They would have two chromosomes. These chromosomes would go both ways during reduction division of meiosis. But in this case, here's probably a trivalent here. So they at least have trivalence. Two, two are here. One goes this way. One's going that way. One's going that way. Um, but hypothetically, if you get all 11 chromosomes univalence going one way, then the other two bivalence going the other way, you end up with 11 and 22, which would be a hypothetically fertile uh, cell. So that means they would have fertile cells every 1,056 times attempts. So that's why we call it punctuated evolution. So they can have sex with other species, with themselves, but only very rarely. Um, and like other apomix, uh, we think that, uh, in general, these apomictic triploids can spread because they have particularly adaptive genomes. Uh, here's another triploid, which some people call it a microspecies. It's been called a microspecies anyway. We consider it a hybrid, a uh, slender punch, a hybrid Kelvinensis. I guess you could call it the Kelvin Choya. It's pretty widespread between Kelvin and, I don't know if you know where Florence is, it's to the east of Florence. Um, it forms a pretty good populations and it's apomictic and it's triploid, um, but it has other, other forms too. Um, finally, Diese, uh, again, this is the condition uh, which is much rarer in plants than it is in animals where uh, a plant has, it's just one sex. It can have pollen or it can have seeds, but not both. It also happens a lot in riparian plants like willows and ashes and things like that, but it's fairly rare in cactus. One example, uh, a good example of this in cacti is the a uh, Echinoceres yellopiensis, which is a, one of the claret cup cactuses with red flowers. It's a local one, obviously, uh, named from the county here. It's also a hexaploid, so um, that's interesting. In fact, it's the only hexaploid in the genus. It, genus has a lot of species, so we, our, our, our little guy here in our county has more chromosomes than any other in the genus. And, um, Here's a flower that's pollen sterile. You can see the anthers are all aborted here and don't produce any pollen, whereas the pollen fertile flower uh, has plenty of pollen. In fact, you could, I, at least I can see from here that there's pollen on the petals. Finally, I'm going to talk about the cholia hexaploids. And this is an interesting scenario. I recently discovered this species um, serendipitously, because we were on a, a survey out in California, and every morning we had to listen to this speech by a UXO guy on unexploded ordinances, and it's because General Patton had tank maneuvers in that area back in the 40s. And they, and they, uh, they planted these, uh, what they call um, practice mines, where they would blow up and throw paint all over the tank, and they'd say, okay, you're dead. You know, so. But I guess if you step on one, it could hurt you, basically. 
So every morning we had to listen to them say, if you don't know what it is, don't step on it. <laughs> don't pick it up. And then one day they, uh, they, they wanted a day off on a Sunday. So they said, you can't go out because somebody has to tell you not to step on it, these mines. You know? <laughs> so we went out and started playing around and uh, driving down this road onto, to a reference site. And I said, what's that? And I get out and I look at it and I look it up at these people in this line of cars. I say, that's a new species. <laughs> they said, no, no, that's just, that's just the silver choya. I said, no, does the silver choya have red flowers? And they said, no. OK. Um, in fact, it was the uh, cover girl on the last issue of the Cactus and Cycling Journal. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and the neat thing about it is that it does have some flowers that look like uh, the flowers of the silver choya, but then they have these other colors too, extremely variable flower color. So uh, that's neat. Um, so we started looking around and we, we, we noticed that some of these other hexaploids, namely Kalmaliana and San Felipenses from Baja California, and uh, Cylindropuncha wolfii from Southern California, they all were hexaploid, they were all dioecious, and they all possessed flowers of variable color. So there's just amazing correlation. And we've sort of come up with some guesses on maybe how that happened. Maybe they are, uh, for instance, um, aloe polyploids. An aloe polyploid is when you have hybridization and polyploidy mixed uh, to make a, a, a basic a, a hybrid that is polyploid. Uh, an auto polyploid is when one individual or one species doubles its chromosome. It's, it's not a really different species, but it does have two chromosome races. Like, for instance, the diamond choya has those two chromosome races. That's probably an auto. OK. Whoops, did I just mess the thing up? I didn't. Um, so and, and also, when do you have a question? Yeah. You mentioned uh, punctuated equilibrium. Does that imply that the choyas in time suddenly Others? No, that was just applicable to the, the, the triploid. It means that they, that they they reproduce asexually, so they're not really evolving much because without sex, you don't evolve much. Um, but they can have sex every once in a while. That, that's what makes them punctuate, is they have only occasional ability to evolve in that as, and genetically. Um, and then the, the, the development of a hexaploid from, a, say, a diploid or, or triploid or whatever uh, is going to be extremely rare. Uh, Choys have been around for 12 million years. They've had lots of time to uh, form these things. But, but they're just going to have one individual. And so for that to spread, it's going to have to just self and produce seeds that are basically genetically alike which is not good for evolution. So it's not good for uh, adapting to new environments. So we think that Daishi, which forces outcrossing, has evolved in these, these hexaploids for that reason. Um, how are we doing on time? Great. OK, good. <laughs> Plenty of time. All right. Uh, <clears throat> I just want to talk a little bit about the uh, species of choyas that occur in Arizona. Um, starting from A, I'm going to go A to V. And uh, this is Cylindropuncia abyssi. I guess you could call it the choya of the abyss. Because <laughs> it was really, it was named after, uh, because it was occurred at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, in the abyss of the Grand Canyon. So near Peach Springs on the Walpine Nation. Um, and it's probably a relic species that uh, survived down there through climate change. Um, 
Acanthocarpa, which I think is called the staghorn choya. Uh, we decided there are three subspecies on it. This is the Mojave Desert form with sort of a yellow sheaves. It's shrubby. It can be up to two or three meters tall. A little bit of an orange flower. Um, in the Sonoran Desert, you get this form that is, uh, it doesn't have, it has more of a white sheath. Um, and um, see, there's another character that was good for this. It'll come to me. And then in the middle elevation, um, there's this form that is less spiny and has these very long tubercles on the stems. So those are three subspecies of uh, acanthocarpa that occur in Arizona. A buscula is an odd thing. This is a hexaploid. It's not one of the sexy hexes because uh, it doesn't have variable flower color and it's not dioecious. It does have an odd meiosis, which I won't go over right now. But uh, it does, it's apomictic and it's, uh, like I said, it's hexaploid. It's pretty common especially the Tucson area. Um, we talked, I already talked ad infinitum about the big alovii, which is the teddy bear choya. Uh, the kind of carpa, the silver or the golden choya, has these very spiny fruits on it. Um, the chain fruit choya, uh, which I talked about, uh, has this interesting flower that opens up toward the uh, evening. And one day I, I sat down in my chair in the uh, Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument and, and, and watched it. And during the day, just before the sun went down, all these bees were visiting it and bee light flies and things like that. And as soon as the sun went down, the moths came out and started pollinating it, or at least visiting it. And uh, I wish that would be a good senior thesis to study the pollination of this thing. Um, there are other forms. This one's been called variety mammalata with very few spines, very green plant. Forms like this occur in, in Sonora and all the way down to Sinaloa, northern Sinaloa, in fact. And then near Florence again, this, there's this golden spine form I thought was pretty cool. It'd be nice to have introduced that into horticulture. Um, in fact, the boxing glove comes from that I don't know if, you, if you're a cactus enthusiast, there's this weird looking crested form um, of folds that are called boxing glove, and that comes from Florence as well. Uh, Imbricata subspecies Spinoza, you'll, you'll find this, uh, the cane choya. In, in, in most recent books, you'll find this as cylinder punches, just Spinoza. Or, and uh, we, we put it as a subspecies mainly to do with our, our, our DNA studies and also the, the similarities in morphology and uh, the fact that they sort of integrate uh, in, within their distributions. It has these yellow to greenish uh, knobby fruits. And speaking of fasciation, here's a fasciated stem. And uh, I can talk more about that if there's time later. Uh, the Christmas joy again, cylinder punch of Lepticollis. Has these very thin stems, and this also has one of those flowers that opens up in the evening. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. Uh, this, in fact, this looks a lot like Chuck Wallensis. <laughs> and um, but it was originally known only from Blue Diamond area, just west of Las Vegas. That was the only locality known until a woman from the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service found a bunch of other populations around Arizona. Since then, we found a lot more, but I, I did a study of it and decided that these plants, these populations near Kingman that have, at, least at, the, at the type locality, these have almost spineless fruits. But the ones in Arizona, these, these populations that looked like it had spiny fruits. And everybody thought that was just a silver choya, but doing a morphological analysis, I said, no. It's, it's all the blue diamond choya. The ones in Arizona, ones in Arizona have spiny fruits. The ones in Nevada don't, so what? But uh, um, 
And then with DNA, it shows, yeah, they come out right together, so. Oh, this is the diamond shoya, not the blue diamond shoya. Call it the diamond shoya because of these little diamond-shaped tubercles. Um, and this is the one that had the uh, two chromosome races, the tetraploid and the diploid. And uh, again, slender punch of thorberized subspecies versicolor. You'll find it as ver just versicolor in the most recent books, but we decided based on DNA and morphology and distribution that it should become slender punch of thorberized subspecies versicolor. Uh, versicolor comes from the variable flower color in it as well. Um, another interesting plant that may or may not be a good species, this is uh, a pentaploid, which means it has 55 chromosomes. And you can't split 55 in two, so it means the sex cells are basically sterile. So this only reproduces asexually. It's probably of hybrid origin, but because we don't know what the parents are, we just, okay, what's the species? What the hell? So, um, again, our local, local plant, uh, the whipple choya. And this is the uh, subspecies in Otis that occurs down in the lower elevations. And I guess that's it. So we, yeah, we have time for some questions and answers. Mark, if you could repeat the question back for the live streamers, that would be great. Okay. Is there a clear correlation between, the, say, the morphology of the choya and other characteristics and the environment where they flourish? That's an, an excellent question. <laughs> um, is there a correlation between the morphology of choya and the environment in which they grow? Or uh, other characteristics. Or other characteristics. Um, sometimes in an extreme environment, uh, you, that's where you find the polyploids. So that's, I guess that's one characteristic. Uh, as far as the morphology, um, I think you find the Apomictic species, the one that dropped their joints, more in alluvial situations. Um, and then you find the ones that are sexual more on the rocky circumstance. I haven't thought about this before, so this is, this is, this is making me think. Um, I think in the more arid regions, you have, like the, the Bigelovii has really fat stems, the, 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 the teddy bear choya. And you find that up on very arid, rocky uh, situations that maybe other choyas wouldn't survive in because it has the thicker stems and ability to hold moisture more. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I would have to think about that more because that's a very good question. That's another excellent question. So basically, how do you go from a diploid to a polyploid? Okay. So um, we've never witnessed what we call an unreduced gamete. So we haven't followed a meiosis and seen it not um, divide. Uh, the number of the chromosomes, but it obviously does happen because you get these gametes that are unreduced gametes. So just take your diploid organism and in case that uh, choyas would, uh, would be the somatic cells, they're just the cells in its body, have 22 chromosomes. 11 came from one parent, 11 came from the other parent. Um, so, if you have a case where 
one parent um, is trying to produce a, a, a sex cell, which would be 11, but it, it produces 2x instead. So that's, a, that, that, but then that has to meet another unreduced gamete. So unreduced gametes are rare. So when you look at rare things, it's rare times rare is extremely rare. But like I said, you have millions of years to work with. So every once in a probably thousand blue moons, <laughs> these two uh, gametes come together and they form a tetraploid individual. That's the hypothesis. Now, try to prove it. <laughs> Question? So, if we dig back in time and we think about the evolution of the warm deserts of southwestern North America, uh -huh. and we go back into the progenitors of this whole family of plants, how many were there back 8,000, 10,000 years ago when? Warm deserts were opening up, or these deserts that we were close by, and they're coming out of the south. So this hybridizing that's going on is was there only a handful of choya that were really the progenitors to all this hybridizing that's going on? Is this thing, this world expanded northward? Is that I'm trying to dig back in time, trying to figure out how how this all started. Particularly with like climate change, and you're talking about how these plants are re more readily able to move into habitats that are maybe disturbed or changing because of climate change. So it's a big question. I don't know if you can answer it, but um, I'm thinking about thorn scrub, and I'm thinking. I am hearing more, more than one question there. There is a lot. Of <laughs> can you rephrase it to make it just one question? Sure. So is there an Eve for this? This, uh, for cylinder punchia, is there, a, is there a single plant in that coming out of the south that then radiates in the southwest of North America? Okay, um, I might have misspoke that um, I think 12 million years is for the, the tribe. The tribe includes actually two genera, the Grusoni and the cylinder I think the cylinder punchia actually maybe evolved 7 million years ago. Probably in southern Mexico, based on the distribution of choice and most cacti. Um, so let me think about it. If, if, if you have a single species, now we did find with our DNA studies that um, there were species pairs. Uh, there's this thing called Slender Punch of from Texas which occurs in the Chihuahua Desert, and Cylinder Pruncha Econocarpa, that Silver Choya talked about, which is Sonoran Desert. And then there's uh, Cylinder Pruncha Imbricata, which occurs in Texas in the Chihuahua Desert, and Spinoziar, which occurs in the Sonoran Desert. So there are two or three of these things. So obviously, the, as the deserts forms, these things speciated into the different even though they're related, they were isolated from one another, and then they, they speciated. Um, and, that's, and, and that's the kind of scenario that probably happened over and over again in different environmental situations. And, and then, um, and then if, if they both spread, it, they, they could come back together again, and that's when they hybridize. So there's a lot of hybridization, hybridization around Tucson. So we, we just attributed that to the university and the promis promiscuity that happens there. Um, one of the interesting things, and I, I, I wish I could go back to that slide in this thing with a punch of Whipley, or with a slender punch of Whipley eye, was that you have the population going up the north, around the north to the, uh, to the west. And then the notice coming down like this. Um, and then uh, there's another species that it, Whipple, we think, turned into, which is the multigeniculata. They're dirty genetically related. And it's almost like this circle of a speciation where it evolved this way uh, in a certain way, and it evolved this way in a certain way, and they came together. 
and where this thing called multigeniculata overlaps with you notice the little diminutive. They look nothing alike. So that's, I thought that was interesting. Another question? On the evolution of spines, so spines have often been thought of as reducing evapotranspiration, for example, in cacti by shading, but also by reducing uh, wind currents that move across and perhaps increase evapotranspiration. Do you see any uh, climal differences or ecotypes within a range based on the potential evapotranspiration? Do you see more spine nesting? Say that more arid areas? Or, or Absolutely, <laughs> yes. And we were noticing too when we were in Baja that they act as drip tips and they, especially when you get toward the coast, when you have more uh, water in the air, humidity, they'll collect the water and they'll, they'll, they'll funnel it down to the bottom of the plant. But uh, yes, uh, these species that occur in less environed in, uh, arid environments are, tend to be less spiny. And those like the teddy bear choy are extremely spiny, and so does uh, the silver choy, and that's, 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 that's extremely spiny. That, that occurs in the, near Yuma and those areas where it's very, very arid. So yeah, good point. Uh, which ones are these? Just the regular puncha and the cylindrical puncha. Oh. Uh, do the prickly pears, a puncha and cylindrical puncha, ever hybridize? And the answer is we've never seen it. I've seen one specimen that uh, was from one of the Channel Islands, and somebody labeled it as an intergeneric hybrid. <laughs> um, but then I looked at it and I said, no, it's just a mutated prickly pear. We do have one intergenetic hybrid we just published on between Grusonia and Cylindropunchas. We called it Cylindronia. <laughs> it was originally discovered by John Redman, who did the Choyas of Baja California. In his notes, he said it's a hybrid, but then he published it as a good species of Grusonia, and we did the DNA, and uh, the chloroplast came out as one parent, and the nuclear DNA came out as the other parent, so it was a pretty cool scenario. I'm curious, what was your feel like before the age of lots of crick? <laughs> a lot simpler. <laughs> um, yeah, alpha taxonomy is basically intuition. Uh, and that was when the person that protested the most won the game. So the, the, the more authority, if you say it with authority, authority it was true. And, and so, yeah, all the, all the old taxonomists, basically, and they still, most taxonomists use intuition. Um, and and the, the, new DNA, the new DNA studies are coming out. In fact, I, I saw this one talk, uh, June, I think her last name, uh, from the Sonian, she, she talked about vitus and parthenocissus, like the vitaceae. And parthenocissus is the Virginia creeper, and vitus are grapes. And she showed this other study that had um, shown that all the, all the parthenocissus were related to, you know, inter, intermixed with the, the vitus. And then she did another study with more genes, more sequences, comparing different techniques. And after a more thorough analysis, all the vitus came out together and all the parthenocystis came out together. So the morphologists, the alpha taxonomists with their intuition were right all along. So. And thank you so much, Mark. And we have a MHI hat for you. Yeah, thank you. We have a you can I thought you already gave me one of these.